Okay. Okay, so everyone, thank you so much for coming to our home buyer seminar this evening. This is a great session where we'll dive in deep with Jill from Members Mortgage and David uh, Golis, our attorney, and Cora Bernier for Liberty Mutual. They will be going over some helpful tips and tricks while you're kind of navigating the market, trying to purchase a new home, refinance, or just really see if the time is right for you. The great thing about working with Members Mortgage is that they're willing to help you all the way like they start from the beginning you get a specialized person that's going to help you and they see you all the way through to the end even if the time might not be right they really do give you those tools um, and things that you need to be able to get where you need to be to purchase your home members mortgage was founded in 1994 and it's a credit union centric mortgage company uh, they work exclusively with credit unions um, and they offer expertise and world-class service. And I can promise you that they're excellent. Thank you so much, Joe, for your service. Um, unlike many other lenders, Members Mortgage connects every applicant with a mortgage expert who is the actual person that's tasked with your lending decision on the application. So it significantly cuts down on miscommunication, bureaucracy, and the collection of needless documents because you're working with somebody who knows you and has been there from the start. Uh, Joe is here and he's joining us from Members Mortgage. Um, he's going to give us insight on the mortgage process, rate trends, and some other useful tips that will be uh, that will help you be successful in this highly competitive market. Uh, Joe is the Executive Vice President of Members Mortgage, um, and he oversees the overall mortgage production from day to day. Um, he is licensed to lend over, all over uh, New England and Florida. Um, and they have actually closed over $1.7 billion in credit in your mortgages over the last three years. Um, so thank you, Joe, for that. We also have attorney David Golis here joining us. He is the president of Golis, Golis, and Golis. He has been practicing law for 26 years. Um, he works with his father, who established the firm over 60 years ago in Manchester, Connecticut. You guys are probably familiar with that area. So it's always nice to have someone local. Um, he works with his brother, John, as well. Um, he primarily handles residential refinances and home purchases. Um, they have a long-standing relationship with Members Mortgage, um, and he actually handles most of the closings. We have Cora joining us from Liberty Mutual as well. Welcome. Uh, she's the lead sales representative at Liberty Mutual. She's been there for three years. She truly enjoys helping members get the best deals on their insurance and helps them um, kind of navigate what to look for when they're picking out the insurance that's best for them. So thank you very much for your time. We can get started. We do have the chat area. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, so that way we'll be able to get you the answers that you need. And Joe, I'll let you take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Octavia. Uh, that was a great introduction. Again, my name is Joe Zampatella. I run the lending department at Members Mortgage Company. We've been working with credit unions for pretty much 30 years. And what makes us really significantly different than most of the lenders that you talk to is that we have partners that give us directive from the very beginning. So we know exactly what we want to do in terms of your loan. We know exactly the rates and terms that we can offer. We are giving you a dedicated expert that allows you to kind of understand the process before you even start you know, bidding on homes or even going to an open house. You understand the requirements of getting a loan and you understand the different characteristics of loans that we can produce. So if you're looking for a 12 unit property, we're probably not the best lender. But if you're looking as a first time home buyer, if you're looking for you know even a two family or three family, that's definitely something that we can help with. And again, you're gonna be put with somebody that's a mortgage expert that's gonna handhold you from the first day that you start an application all the way through to the day that you meet with Dave to sign the paperwork to close. So I kind of wanna go through initially some market commentary so you understand what the market's like right now in, in the housing. And then I want to go through some loan requirements for first time home buyers. And, and even if it's not your first time buying a home, what's expected of you? What are the kind of parameters of getting approved for a loan? I'm going to go through the buying process so you understand who your competition is, what the kind of characteristics of a transaction looks like, um, there's different steps along the process, and then kind of different strategies that would help you be successful. I'll talk a little bit about interest rates. I'll talk a little bit about um, you know monthly payments and things like that. And then I'll turn it over to uh, Attorney Golis, and he'll talk to you about the closing 
And then of course, we're gonna have Cora from Liberty Mutual who can talk to you about the insurance requirements that are gonna be essential for you to get into the closing table. So I'll start with just some overall market commentary. And kind of the first thing I've been telling everybody that's been calling me is that the demise of the housing market was greatly exaggerated. Okay, everybody saw interest rates go from 3% to north of seven and started getting you know, heart palpitations because they thought that housing prices were gonna take a big dive. What I can tell you from just being in this industry is that the Northeast is very insulated because they have a diversity of employment opportunities. Okay, in certain areas of the country, you're seeing you know, large employers, if they pull out of that area, there's a significant drop of um, you know, people that wanna to move to that area. So if anybody has to sell their home, you're gonna see significant decline in value. Also with places like Florida, places like Arizona that are more seasonal, when economic conditions get a little bit more difficult, you're gonna see buying and selling a little bit more aggressively because of just how, how you, you know, favor your primary residence versus a secondary residence. Um, we're not seeing that in the Northeast. Even if you lost your job, there are you know, many more employers out there and many more employment opportunities. So there's not a whole heck of a lot of forced selling. So you're not going to see a, a ton of, of deals that are just you know, very, very cheap. We're still seeing multiple bid situations. We're still seeing lack of inventory. Um, so what, when I say lack of inventory, what that means is that there's not a whole you know, number of homes coming up for sale. Right, so you see out there on any given day, maybe a listing or two, if there were 20, 30 listings a day, there might be a situation where there are more homes to buy than there are buyers to buy them. We're still not in that case. There's still very few homes for sale. There are a lot of people that want to buy them, even with the higher interest rates you know, compared to 2020 and 2021. There are still significant competition on each of these homes. So I would pretty, pretty easily say that it's a seller's market and you should be prepared well ahead of time to go into a bidding situation because that's what we're seeing on, on pretty much all of the properties that come up for sale. And we've had a mild winter. And right? whenever there's a mild winter, there's an early buying season. So when there's an early buying season, you're seeing a lot of people have been kind of sitting on the sidelines over the winter waiting for the homes to come for sale. So you're seeing a little bit more of that frenzied. As we get later into the, the summer months and even into the fall, you might see some of the homes that have stuck around for a little while. Maybe they're a little overpriced and they'll start to come back down. In that case, you might get some opportunities to negotiate a little bit harder, but for, for right now, anything that is appropriately priced that has quality, right? I mean, it, that is a marketable property. It's not in disarray or anything like that. You're going to see a, a healthy competition for it. Right now, we're in the highest interest rate environment in 22 years. Um, the average 30-year fixed mortgage is at 6.82%. Our 30-year fixed that we printed today is at 6%. So we're significantly lower than the average, but you know, obviously there's a lot of different products out there. So the average 30 years at 6.8%. Um, and then we're seeing the costs associated with obtaining financing skyrocketing over the last few years because of trended data with credit analysis, which basically when you have a credit report in the past, it was, hey, if you make your payment, they report that your payment was made and that was the, you know, the end of it. Now they're actually keeping track of things, how much you paid each month on your credit cards, on your student loans, on any existing mortgages. So they can see if you're prepaying items, they can see if you, um, you know, are paying things off in bulk and large payments. And that all is contributing into this calculation of what your credit score is. So credit modeling is getting very expensive. Credit reports are getting very expensive. Um, so all of these things are contributing to higher costs of borrowing, higher costs uh, in terms of like closing costs and things like that, which makes it more and more difficult for first-time home buyers. So as we look at first-time home buyer, let's talk about some of the requirements that would be necessary to get approved for a loan. Through secondary market financing, the minimum down payment for buying a home is 3% for a single family home or a condo. Okay? And so most people, when they're coming into a situation where they're buying their first home, scraping together every cent is um, as difficult as it can be. And so we have the lowest in the industry with 3% as your minimum down payment. Okay? So that's the first requirement that we look for. The second is that your minimum FICO score, your credit score is going to be over 620. Okay? And typically credit scores range somewhere between 425, 430 and 850, 860. 
Okay, so anything over 620 is kind of right in the middle there. And we would have products available for you uh, with as little as 3% down. And then the third item, which is a little bit more nuanced, is this concept called your debt to income ratio. And your debt to income ratio is a calculation of what you can quote unquote afford. Okay, and so a lot of people say, Joe, Joe, what's the most loan I can afford? And I like to answer that question with a question, which is, well, what do you want to pay? Right? Because a lot of the time you can afford more than what you really want to pay. And so if I say to you, hey, your payment's going to be $6,800 a month and I can get you qualified for that, that's not necessarily something you want to come out of pocket with each month. So it's really a good discussion to have with a loan officer the first day that you apply is, hey, I'm comfortable with $1,700 a month. What's that corresponding loan amount? Now, depending on what product you look at and what you know, um, the market is around you, it may or may not be reasonable to have a $1,700 a month payment. You might end up with a, you know, if you're, if you're buying in Fairfield County, you're not going to have too many places that the taxes are going to be less than $1,700 a month. Um, but it does allow you to kind of have a good idea of what you can afford, what the price range is that you're looking at, um, and kind of your overall strength as a buyer to go in and initially go through this check to see if you meet these criteria. So when we get into your debt to income ratio, what we're going to look at is the minimum monthly payments on all of your outstanding debt. Things like car loans, student loans, credit card debt, any other mortgages that you have, we're going to take the minimum monthly payment on those plus a proposed mortgage payment, right? And that includes the principal and interest on the mortgage, the real estate taxes, the homeowner's insurance. Uh, if you need mortgage insurance on your loan, we'd have mortgage insurance in that calculation. And we'll divide that figure by your before tax monthly income. It's a whole lot of math talk. But basically, the ratio we're looking for is 45% or lower. So if your total debt is 45% of your average income, you can qualify for that loan. So it's a hard thing to do yourself because you don't necessarily know what home you're going to buy. You don't necessarily know what the taxes are going to be in Cheshire or in Middletown or in New Britain or wherever it is you're looking. So we have all of these modeling tools. We can get everything set up with an application. And we can manipulate that application depending on which property you look at. So you might be able to qualify for a $200,000 loan in New Britain and a two hundred and thirty dollars or $250,000 loan in Cheshire or wherever you're looking. Okay. And so those are the three major components that we're looking at in order to get you qualified for a loan. Now, just because you are qualified for a loan with me does not necessarily mean that you're going to be able to win a bid the first time you go out. So a lot of people call me, they go, Joe, I have my pre-qualification -pre letter. I submitted a bid for exactly what the you know, listing agent was looking for. And I've gone to 10 you know, different bidding opportunities and I, I can't get my bid accepted. Remember that there's always a strategy associated with the way that the real estate brokers are pricing a home. They're either trying to price it low to get a lot of attention, or they're in a situation where they're trying to you know, price it to the moon as high as they can to see even if they get a little bit less than that, it's still a very competitive price. So what I would suggest, right, as a first time home buyer, is to find somebody who's an expert in the areas that you're looking at. Okay, that is really the most important thing that you can do as a first time home buyer is to identify your lender, right, the Dutch Point Credit Union members mortgage company, then to find an expert realtor who is not a part time realtor. It's not somebody that comes in and does, you know, weekends or has a one listing a year or as your aunt's friend or, you know, your college roommate. It's going to be somebody who is dedicated to the business. Okay, who does nothing else but is a realtor, who is an expert in the towns or you know county or whatever area that you're looking in, because that's the person who's going to be able to evaluate you know, how expensive or inexpensive the home is, the type of, of demand that you're getting in, on that property, what your bidding strategy is going to be, getting a contract signed that's a competitive contract that's you know, feasible and reasonable. Some people think that having uh, no realtor puts them in a better situation. But the reality is that even though that realtor is going to be paid to do work, you're going to end up in a better situation where you can see homes earlier in the process. You can see um, the competition kind of availed in front of you. So you're in a situation that you can be successful when you bid rather than just keeping on hitting that asking price and either way overpaying for a property or not even being competitive. Okay. The second person that you need other than the lender um, is going to be a good real estate attorney. Okay. Members Mortgage Company has a closed list of attorneys. We do not work with every attorney out there because we feel that there are certain people that value the member the same way that we value the member. You're not a customer. 
right? This isn't a bank. This is a credit union where you matter. So we want to make sure that our attorneys treat you the same way. So we have people like Dave Golis, who has a long track record in the credit union industry, who understands the benefits of working with members of mortgage and the credit union, and understands that our member service is of the utmost importance and that monetarily, we don't need to hit home runs. We just need to make sure that everybody's taken care of and that they want to come back again and again for their financing. So Dave, I'm going to turn it over to you because I, I feel like this is a, a good time Perfect. to introduce the Perfect. legend, Dave Golis. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. Uh, again, yeah, I'm Dave Golis. I do work here in Manchester. We cover um, a lot, many here at Hartford County, Holland County. I've been lucky enough to work with Joe in Dutch Point for a long time now. And it's I've done thousands of closings, especially over the last few years with members mortgage. Um, so basically what happens is after you have this real estate agent, you found your house and you entered into a contract and you send everything to Joe and his loan officers, they're gonna process your file and eventually send it to me. Um, and what happens is I am members mortgage attorney. Um, Typically, most we introduce, I would introduce myself, my office staff, Olivia would call you and say that we're going to help members mortgage, but we can also help you as well, which is to your benefit because uh, I have worked with members a long time. They have a closing department. We know exactly how to operate and get your closing done on time. And all of your fees are set by members mortgage for a long time for my fee and for the title searches and all the expenses. So when Joe and his loan officers disclose to you what your costs are going to be in the very beginning, those are my costs and they don't go up and they are below what an, a market would pay if you called on the phone because of the volume and the relationship that we have. So we know that we can execute efficiently, get you in the house, and take care of members mortgage and Dutch point, everyone is all set. Um, you are also not required to use my services. You could have your own attorney uh, in which case you would be paying your attorney their fee, and then you also pay me because I'm still in charge of the closing. So not to, you know, push my services, but obviously it makes it a lot easier and it's the least expensive. Um, that being said, once you have your contract, we would also help you. Sometimes people don't have real estate agents. They might be doing a family transaction. They need a contract. All of that is there's no extra fees or anything. I help you sign a contract with the seller so that you have your house and that goes to members mortgage as well. Um, there's a, in the process, usually there's a few things that are important. Number one is most contracts have a mortgage contingency so that Joe and his loan officers can make sure that they process your loan in time and say you have a loan on this date so that you'll have money to purchase. So that's kind of like an important clause. Um, you also may or may not this market, truly there isn't a lot of inspections going on. Everything is as is, people are buying but sometimes there are inspection provisions that are usually 14 days in Connecticut after your signing of the contract. So you would hire your experts. And if there was issues, you'd wanna make sure that those things were resolved with your agent or with my office and the seller's office to make sure if there was something that needed to be repaired. Sometimes it can be, um, instead of having it repaired, you could ask for a closing cost credit. So you would have some money that the seller would theoretically be giving to you and reducing your costs at the closing. Um, we also would then go what, in Connecticut, depending on what town you're in, that's where your deed is registered and the seller's deed is. So we do most importantly a title search to make sure that the seller owns it. If they have any liens, that they paid their taxes, they have mortgages, all that is taken care of. So there would be a title search done to make sure that you would get clean title. Um, and then we would coordinate with the seller's attorney and my office to make sure that there's a closing date. Uh, we'd have documents from members mortgage. You would close typically in my office. Money is uh, handled all through my office and it gets dispersed to the sellers. Um, and I'm trying to think um, in that process. And um, a lot of times for first time home buyers, if, if you go through this seminar, you hopefully find a house, you call Dutch Point, you get to Joe. Um, even though you have an initial loan disclosure, you could call me and say, hey, Dave, could you look at my disclosure? I'm buying in Bolton. And I would tell you Bolton might have a little different tax structure than in other towns. So you may have to pay a little more in taxes depending on your closing date. I can figure that out. I would ask questions like, does the property have oil? Are there extra propane tanks? Um, things like that where they might, those are added expenses and aren't necessarily disclosed because a loan officer doesn't know really what you're buying and they wouldn't know the customs 
um, for closing costs. So sometimes oil, it, it's expensive now. It can be five, six, seven hundred dollars. A different town, if the taxes, uh, if it was in Bolton, you'd have to maybe pay three or four months more than another town. So this is all money that would cut into your bottom line a little bit that you have figured out. So I like to kind of produce, a, I could really, off of the initial CD that you get from Joe, I could do a 99% and get it almost exact and say in two months, your closing is going to be this much and there'd be no surprises. So I like to do that so that you would understand the closing processes. And, there, and there's been plenty of times when I've called people and said, oh, you have to bring this amount of money. And um, they weren't aware that, a that there was a giant propane tank that had a thousand gallons of propane in it. And they had to bring, you know, a thousand dollars extra. So a lot of times it's good just to go through those things. Um, I am happy to answer any questions, you know, after if you're on a phone call, if you're um, in your uh, contract negotiations and you had some issues, you could call me even though I'm not, I don't have a file. You could just say who you are um, and that you were in the home buying seminar. I'd be happy to help you. So, and you also do need a good insurance agent because you want to make sure your house is insured. And that's what Cora is here to talk to us about, I assume. Thank you. Hi guys, I'm Cora, um, an insurance agent out of Glastonbury, Connecticut. Um, so once you find your wonderful team of a lender, an attorney, and a realtor, you're going to have to talk to someone like me, who's your agent. Um, so basically, I'm going to just give you the breakdown of the most important parts of insurance um, real quick. So when you're searching for um, homeowners insurance, you can go to an agent who's a broker, or you can just search on your own. Um, no matter what, that's totally fine. I'm going to share my screen real quick and just show you the breakdown of coverages real quick. Can you guys see that? Oops. Oh, where'd it go? I'm so sorry. We can see it. Okay. So hang on one second. We want this one. Okay. That is not the one I'm trying to show. <laughs> So sorry, guys. All right, can you see this? Okay, awesome. So this is what is most important when you are looking into an insurance policy. The most important document is the declarations page. So this is the breakdown of the coverage of your home. So coverage A is your dwelling. And in this case, this person's dwelling coverage, which is the bones and the structure of their house is 347,800. Coverage B is the other structures. Um, so basically what that means is um, unattached garages, things like that on the property that we would need to rebuild. And this person on this specific policy would get 10% of the dwelling, which is 34,000 to rebuild anything that happened to those garages, fences, other structures. I always explain personal property coverage C as if you took your house, you flipped it upside down and you shook it. Anything that falls out is your personal property. So that's your stuff. Um, and basically they would have 260,850 um, to replace the things in their house if God forbid there was a fire or anything like that. Coverage D is loss of use. So basically what that means if your property became unlivable for some reason, whether it's a fire or something like that, um, a bunch of companies have a dollar amount on it or actual loss. So in this case, Liberty Mutual has actual loss. They will pay whatever is needed for you to stay in a hotel and get food um, and lodging until it's back to rebuild and until you can live in your house again. So that's definitely very important that you either have enough coverage there or the company will pay as needed. Coverage E is your personal liability. This is another extremely important. Um, in Connecticut, it's usually 300,000. This is just an example. Um, you want at least 300,000. And what that means, if someone say came to your house and your dog bit them or something, they, they could sue you. And this is what you have the liability coverage um, to cover that. So you wouldn't have to you know lose your house um which brings me to i will stop sharing for one second so oh we have a question <laughs> yes how can i how can i answer it for you i don't think they were able to see the same screen that you were seeing that i think that was just the one thing 
Oh, okay. Yeah. So I can always send it out to you guys too, um, just a breakdown, or we can have a conversation, whatever works for you guys. Um, yeah, I know it was a little, I couldn't even see myself for a while on the screen. Um, but yeah, we can talk about that. So that's the breakdown of the coverages. Another thing on your auto policy, a lot of people don't think auto and home policies intertwine, um, but on your auto policy, when you're becoming a homeowner, there's something called bodily injury limits and coverage. Basically what that is, um, is it's, you either see 2550, which is state minimums, 5100, 10300 or 25500. When you become a homeowner, you want at least 10300 or 25500 as your bodily injury limits and what that means is if you were to get into an accident, a car accident, um, it would be 100,000 per person that the insurance company would cover or 300 per accident. So the reason why you want that higher when you're a homeowner is because if you were to get into an accident, people go after your house, which is your biggest asset. So you want to make sure you're completely covered in that sense because people will go after those big things, which leads me to also if you're becoming a homeowner, which your insurance agent will talk to you about all of this, but um, an umbrella doesn't hurt either um, because basically um, if you qualify for an umbrella, which is either 100, 300 or 250, 500 as a homeowner, it's an extra um, liability coverage up to a million or 2 million or whatever you choose. So you definitely won't lose those big assets. Um, if someone were to sue you, you just want to make sure that, you know, you're paying so much money into this thing that you worked so hard for, and you just don't want anything to happen to it. So that's the whole point. You just want to make sure it's insured properly. Um, a lot of people go for price with insurance coverage. It's not about that. You want to make sure that if something happens, we can rebuild your house to exactly what it was, if not better. Um, so definitely in those coverages, even though the price may look good, sometimes really see what you're buying. And that's what I'm here for. I'm more than happy to talk that through with you. Um, what, so on a happy, happy note, there's discounts. We love that. <laughs> Who doesn't like a good discount? Um, even though we all want to save money, um, proper coverage means more, but there are discounts. There's a huge discount for working or being a Dutch point member, um, which is great. So we can always talk about that too. Um, there is a multi-policy discount. So if you bundle your home auto, everything like that, you can save a lot of money there. Um, there's an early shopper discount. So as a new or first time home buyer, the earlier you shop for insurance, the cheaper rate you're going to get. Um, also another thing, if you're renting and you have renter's insurance and you go to purchase homeowner's insurance, you will save a bunch of money there. Um, a lot of people don't know that it's a little tidbit. It's really good to have renter's insurance because they, it shows the insurance companies that you're insurable, um, beforehand. So they love to see that it's part of your insurance score. Um, and then if you have like a ring doorbell or something like that, you can get a discount for that, which is great. Um, if you had no prior claims on your homeowner's insurance or renter's insurance, that's a good factor too. Um, we do a new purchase discount and um, a newly renovated discount too. And then the last thing I'll say is the most important thing when you're purchasing a home is to find a team that cares about you. And I think the community in itself, like of Dutch Point, and how friendly everyone is and, and the team that's involved in all of this. Like we really care and we wanna get you to that home closing. So that's the goal. We're all trying to help each other and we wanna make sure you're, you're happy with your coverage and your purchase and everything in between. So once you find a team that really cares about the common goal, you will get there. And um, you know we're so happy for you guys for whenever you're ready to purchase that home. <laughs> Great, thank you, Cora, I appreciate it. So now that we've met the team, right, we know we need a real estate broker that's specific to the community you're looking to buy in. We know we want a Dutch Point Credit Union member's mortgage to be the lender. We want Dave Golis to do the closing, and we want Cora to do our insurance at the end. Now let's understand the buying process, right? So from my perspective, we're seeing intense competition for homes. Most first-time home buyers are 22 to 38-year-old people. They're tech-savvy. So they're utilizing things like Zillow and Redfin and Trulia, and they're looking up all of this publicly available information to come up with valuation methodology. And um, you know they're doing all sorts of uh, triage on the 
different properties before they even step foot in it. So you're seeing people bid on properties without ever going to the property physically, right? There's a lot of people that are investors that are just buying homes sight unseen. It's intense competition. So as a first time home buyer, you almost feel like you're trying to jump on a treadmill that's going full speed. So from your perspective, you want to get yourself situated so that when the home of your dreams comes on for sale, you're not hesitating and you're not fearful of the mortgage process, of the bidding process. You want to be prepared well ahead of time so that when that home does come for sale, you're ready to make a bid the first time you see it. Um, or if an opportunity presents itself where you need to work quickly, you're in a situation where you can work quickly or be flexible. So the first step for any borrower before you see any homes is you're going to want to go online and get pre-approved. Right? And so I'm going to show you how simple that is. And I'm going to share my screen. All right. You guys see my screen? So this is a very familiar looking website, I'm sure, for most of you. It's very simple. You go to borrowing, then mortgages. Okay, there's some nice information here about purchase and refinance, but you're going to go in to get pre-qualified. You hit apply now. And this is a little disclaimer saying, hey, you're leaving Dutch Point Credit Union. You're going to member's mortgage company. And this is what the website looks like. And you can see the different rates and products available. There are different calculators. There are rate trackers. There's closing cost estimates and loan options. There's all sorts of different things that you can find here 24 hours a day. And you can actually go right onto here. Say you're going to purchase a home and start an application. Are you a member of Dutch Point Credit Union or are you eligible for membership? Yes, I am. And you're looking to purchase or refinance and you hit continue. It's that simple. All right. So you go out 24 hours a day, you can fill out an application. And within 24 hours of that application starting, you're going to be contacted by a member's mortgage loan officer. That person is licensed through the National Mortgage Licensing System to be a loan officer in the state of Connecticut. And they're going to talk to you from the very first moment that you start an application. Again, you don't have to complete. You just have to start it. And they're going to start listening to what your goals are for the transaction. They're going to start talking about potential problem points and things that you can do to situate yourself so that when you do find the home, you're going to be in a situation where you can take advantage of the lowest rates and terms. You can um, close faster than anybody else in the industry. And that at least you have an idea of the process for you individually and not generically. I'm going to talk generically today because everybody has a different situation. Um, but as I kind of go through the spiel, if you have any questions, feel free to type it into the chat box. Because I'm sure that if you have that question, there's 10 other people in this chat, uh, in this webinar that also have that question. Uh, and then obviously, if you have any specific questions about yourself, I'm going to put my contact information in the chat box at the end. You're welcome to shoot me an email. I'm obsessed with my phone. My wife's going to kill me one day because I look at it so often. Um, but it will be there available for you. So you're welcome to email me 24 hours a day with any questions. And I most likely will get back to you within an hour. Um, but so when you go out and you're going to fill out this application, you're going to put in things like your name, your birthday, your social security number, your address. We're going to do a hard credit inquiry on you. Right? So we want to see what your FICO score is. We want to see what your actual liabilities are, what your monthly payments are. Because the reality is, is somebody who you can go apply for a pre-qualification and you don't need to run a credit report, that paper isn't even worth the pre-qualification, right? It's just worth nothing because they haven't based the pre-qualification on anything. They've just done it based off of information that you're putting in there. So you run into all sorts of surprises and confusion when you go to do the formal mortgage process. What we do is we do an initial pre-qualification, which captures all of this information. And then when you find a property, all we have to do is put in the address into that initial application and you hit the ground running. There aren't multiple credit checks. There aren't um, you know, duplicitous applications. It's just one application and we handle it from beginning to end. And you can go in 24 hours a day, see all your disclosure paperwork, all of the loan documents, your pre-approval letter. There's all sorts of information in this one portal that you have access to, I have access to, and the credit union has access to. So if you needed help from somebody at the credit union, they'd be there to help you. If you need help from me personally, I could be there to help you. If you had, you know, need help from your loan officer, again, they're obsessive with their phones the same way that I am. So they're available almost 24 hours a day for any questions that you have. Now, from coming to this seminar and listening to me talk, I want to give everybody a promo code. So Typically, it costs like $25 to, to fill out an application because of the cost of those credit reports. I trust that you're all serious buyers, and I, I want to give you a, a free pre-qualification. So if you go and you fill out this application, you put in your name, your birthday, your social, and then the next page asks you for a $25 fee. Now, 
instead of putting in that fee, you're going to put in loan one. I just put it in the chat, L-O-A-N and the number one. It's all in lowercase letters. When you fill that in, you're going to bypass that expense, waive it, and you'll just be able to fill out that application and get a free pre-qualification uh, letter for yourself so that you can go out and start bidding on homes. No obligation to do business with us, no obligation to uh, you know be an exclusive lending partner or anything like that. We just want to make sure that you get the best information that you can as early as you can in the in the process so that you're in a situation where you're able to you kind of weed out the potential problem points put yourself that you're very very confident that when you do get that house your dreams under contract there aren't going to be any surprises so the earlier earlier that you do that the earlier that you meet your loan officer who's going to usher you through this process the earlier that you can start on the documentation and understanding of what's going to be expected of you and then again you'll be in a situation where you can be uh competitive on any home that comes up for sale. So when you're looking at the listings, right? So once you get pre-qualified, you're going to want to start tracking the homes in your area, right? So I don't know if you're going to be looking at Bloomfield or wherever you're looking, but you should go on to the Redfins and the Zillows and the Trulias and put in parameters of houses that you're looking at, right? So you've talked to your loan officer. They've said, hey, based off your income, based off your payment, you know, based off of your credit history, I think that you'd be comfortable somewhere in the two hundred fifty dollars to $300,000 range you have 3% down payment, this is what your payment would look like. So you put in a, a tracker through one of these sites that says, hey, anything that comes up for sale in Cheshire, send me you know, the listing so I can look at it. Familiarize yourself with the, the taxes, familiarize yourself with things that you like, that you don't like. Go to open houses, even if you don't want to bid on the house. Just go walk through, get a feel for how these things work. I've sold condos in you know Hartford and in, in New Haven that... People are like, oh, I could never go in a, a thousand square foot condo. It's too big or too small. And you walk in and it's just acts differently than you expected. So just familiarize yourself with the type of properties that you're looking at and just make yourself a more informed person so that when you do talk to the realtors, you can say, hey, I need an attached garage or um, you know, I need to be close to this school or I need to be close to this you know, transportation or highway or you know, employer. It just allows you to kind of centralize your focus so that the homes that come up for sale are not just a vast sea of homes. It's really specialized to what you're looking for. Okay. Typically what happens in this market, we're seeing homes list on Wednesday, Thursday. They'll do an open house so you can go and actually see the house on like Saturday or Sunday. We've even seen like commuter open homes on like a Thursday or Friday in the afternoons, sometime like five, six o'clock where you can come in. They might even have like a cocktail or something like that, make it fun. Uh, and so they do Saturday, Sunday, maybe one extra on another day. Then they leave Monday open so that you can go talk to your lender, talk to your attorney, understand what's going on. And then the bids are due by Tuesday, right? So that's the strength of the market is there. Not, am I going to get a bid? But hey, hold off your bids until Tuesday and then send them all in. By Wednesday, you're going to hear of somebody having an accepted offer. You typically have a one to two week inspection period if you have an inspection contingency, so you'd have uh, an inspector that would go out to the property, take a look at it for you. You know, inspector is not going to find everything that's possibly wrong with the house. And by no means is the seller expected to have a house in perfect condition when they sell it to you. But it really, you can use it as a, a roadmap to home ownership. You want to see things that are um, potentially large expenses. Right? If one of the outlets doesn't work correctly, that's minor. If the, you know, the roof has a cracked beam or there's a crack in the foundation or something that's going to cost tens of thousands or if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to fix, that's where it's worth the couple hundred dollars to have a, an inspection done. Now, I wouldn't say that you want to have an inspection done on every single property that you go see because that's going to be very expensive very quickly. But if you get a house under contract in that period, if you have an inspection contingency, you have the inspection done, you can review it and you're able to back out without any financial loss if something comes up that scares you, okay? So then after that period, there's usually a 25 to 35 day mortgage contingency period. So a mortgage contingency is, hey, I'm making a bid on this home, assuming that I can get a mortgage, right? And so if for whatever reason, say we got pre-qualified with members mortgage company, I gave you a letter, you went through in two weeks into the, the process, you got laid off, right? Or your you know, significant other had to, go out on, on disability. You know, there's all sorts of things that can happen. And now all of a sudden you don't qualify anymore. I could then give you a denial and you would be able to get, again, your deposit money back. And that would allow you to 
you know, step away from the contract without any financial liability. And so that's a very important thing to have, especially as a first time home buyer. We're going to do the triage up front. We're going to look at those three things that I told you. But again, there's a lot of things in life that can happen. So unless you planned on writing a check for the home, it's always good to include a mortgage contingency as a first time home buyer. I own a mortgage company, right? I don't typically have a mortgage contingency because I have very little fear that I'm going to be able to get a mortgage. Not everybody has that, that luxury. So make sure that you protect yourself in the event that the worst case scenario could happen. Now, from there, usually a closing takes place in the 30 to 45 day range. Um, we can close a loan in as little as 10 days, okay, which sounds like an absurdly quick amount of time um, and a very unique buyer and seller situation. But if that situation came up for you, because you're dealing with the person who makes the lending decision from day one, who's already coached you on exactly what they need, you already had the prep ahead of time, we have these great networks of attorneys and um, appraisers and everything that kind of could fall together. 10 days is the legally the shortest amount of time that we could close the loan. And we've done it. So I would suggest keeping it to a 30 to 45 day process for your own sanity. But also keep in mind that these are things that you can do by working with the Dutch Point Credit Union and Members Mortgage Company that nobody else out there can do, which puts you ahead of the game. Uh, so right before you go to closing, right, usually about a week before the closing, we're going to issue your final closing disclosure. And this is the number one thing that puts a wrench in getting that closing disclosure out. And it's comical that it takes this long, but I would suggest that you talk to your insurance agent right around the time that you're having the inspections done, right? Because we go through these processes with so many people, not people like Cora. Cora's on the ball. She knows what she's doing. But there are people out there that they wait until just before the closing, before they start shopping for homeowner's insurance. Get that done. Because you already know what the address is. You already know what your loan amount is going to be. You have a very good idea what the closing date is going to be. So call her, get your policy and your, your declarations page ready to go. Send it over to Dave, send it over to me, and we'll make sure that there's nothing that delays your closing. It's not the underwriting that's the problem. It's not sending in the documentation. It's not getting the contracts. It's not getting the appraisal. It's always the insurance that slows things down. And Cora will take care of you and make sure that you guys hook up early and get it all taken care of. So now we understand you get that closing disclosure. That's going to show you the exact amount of your closing costs. It's going to show you exactly how much money you need to bring to the closing. And it's also going to give you an idea of what your monthly payments are going to be going forward. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. And so that's the most important document that you're going to get right around the closing. And you want to keep that for tax purposes, just in case the CPA wants to see any of the closing costs that you paid. Because sometimes, you know, if you pay points or things like that, it can be tax deductible, save you a little bit on your, your income tax. So now that we understand kind of the timeline, let's just talk about rates. 2020, 2021, height of COVID, stimulus money everywhere, interest rates got down to the lowest they've ever been. Um, my hair was jet black at the time. And so now we've seen all of that kind of play out. Interest rates dropped, 30 year fix was in the twos. February of 2022, that stimulus ran out. We saw markets start to correct. Uh, markets overcorrected, got into around seven, seven and a half on the 30 year fixed. We've since come back down. Our 30 year fixed is at 6%, which again, historically is still excellent. Uh, if you're first time home buyers, a lot of you talk to your parents, they got a loan in 1994 at you know 18% on an adjustable rate mortgage, and they were thankful for it. Um, we're not seeing the rates like that anytime soon, I don't think. Most analysts are calling by the end of next year. For rates to be back down in the fives, you know, maybe low, low fives, high fours, somewhere in that range. So you're certainly on a higher end of the swing, but at 6% on a 30 year fix, you're still historically doing very well. Now, members of the Dutch Point Credit Union, we're trying to help you with affordability, right? So we want to give you options that are available that aren't for everybody, admittedly, but sometimes it makes sense for you. So they have three adjustable rate mortgages. And everyone's, oh God, adjustable rate mortgages. No way, Joe. I don't even want to talk about it. Adjustable rate mortgages are not the same adjustable rate mortgages from the early 2000s that kind of blew up the real estate world. These are amortizing, right? And so what that means is that when you make a principal interest payment for the fixed rate period, you're actually paying some towards interest and some towards principal. What they had originally in the early 2000s were negative amortization. So even though you were making a monthly payment every month, the balance of your mortgage kept increasing. Okay? That's not how these are set up. These are fixed for anywhere from five to 10 years. 
They amortize over a 30 year period. So you still have low monthly payments, but they're fixed for that first five to 10 years. So if you're listening to the analysts who say, hey, over the next five to 10 years, or excuse me, over the 12 to 18 months, you're gonna see interest rates come down significantly. These actually make sense. I just bought a house down the Cape and I took a 5-1 on. So a 5-1 ARM is adjustable rate mortgage. Uh, and so Dutch Point, for just Dutch Point members only, there's a four and a half percent on a five one arm. That's a hundred and fifty basis point difference, right? It's a point and a half, one point five percent difference between a thirty year fix and a five one arm. That's a monthly savings of three hundred and seventy one dollars or so on a four hundred thousand dollar loan, right? So over a five year period, you're going to save twenty two thousand dollars or so, twenty three thousand almost. Okay, and that's just pure interest expense. So you're going to pay more money towards your principal over that time period because your interest rate is lower, your payments will be lower. And again, it's not for everybody. Sometimes if you have a smaller loan, it doesn't make sense. The risk is not worth the reward. But as a first-time homebuyer, typically you have relatively low down payment. Your loan amounts are going to be a little bit higher. Um, and this is a good way to get you into a product that protects you because it has a fixed rate period between five years and 10 years. Right? In, in five to 10 years, you're going to see a, a pretty solid rate cycle where you'll see a, a peak in a valley. Um, and over the, and when you're looking at 10 years, you might even see two rate cycles. So you're going to see right now we're kind of at the high end of the, of the range. And then over that time, there's no prepayment penalty. So at any point in time, if you feel that rates have come down into a, a more reasonable area, you could always refinance. And we could take care of that for you as well. Okay. And just so you understand how adjustable rate mortgages work, uh, they have caps in place. So people go, hey, Joe, well, the, yeah, it's great. It's four and a half percent today, but you know, after the five-year period, it's going to go to 25%. I won't be able to afford it. I go, that's not how it's set up. The way that they're set up, it's called a 225 structure. Okay, 225 means that on the first reset, so on your 61st payment after five years, it can go up by 2% over the previous rate. Each subsequent reset, so every year, you can increase by 2% over the previous year, and then the highest it could ever get is 5% over the initial rate. And you're going to let me go, well, Joe, how, how do they calculate the rate? You know, how, how am I going to guess? How can I keep track of this rate? How do I know if I should refinance? So the rate is based off of the U.S. one-year treasury. You can go to any finance website, um, CNN Money, whatever it is you want to go to, and just look up the U.S. one-year treasury. And then it's plus a, a spread of 2.75%. So whatever's on that site, you add 2.75% of it to that, and that would be your reset rate. Now, you're taking a little bit of risk because we don't know what's going to happen in the next five years. But again, most industry analysts are calling for rates to come down during that period, uh, at least at some point. And so you protect yourself with five years of coverage or up to 10 years of coverage. And for 10 years, you're at 5.015%, right? So you're still roughly 1% lower than the 30-year fixed. So you're going to save a bunch of money and interest income, your monthly payment is going to be significantly lower over that time. And I can't offer this to the, you know, the general public. This is only for Dutch Point Credit Union members. So consider this a service of the credit union. They're trying to help you combat the affordability issues. Property values are climbing. And this is a great product for them. And it's a great product for you. And you get to keep your loan local at the credit union. So you make your payments to the credit union going forward. Be right part of your you know, core account that you can go and see in your online banking. All right. So let's also talk about what kind of differentiates you from a lot of the people that you're competing against. You're working with a credit union. And what that says to the real estate community that you're looking in is that you're banking locally with people who are local. Okay? What you're seeing from Bank of America, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, Guaranteed Rate, um, Rocket Mortgage, you're not necessarily dealing with somebody who is an expert in this area. I don't lend all over the country. I'm not trying to get loans in Ohio and Nebraska. We specialize specifically in the Northeast. Our major hubs are Hartford, New Haven, and Boston. Right? And we also lend in Florida because there are people here that go to Florida. right? But we're not doing it because we're trying to take over Florida. We want to be experts and we want to produce volume for our partners, which keeps everybody's costs down. So if I was out in Ohio, I'm no different than any other lender in Ohio. But here, we're experts. We know the towns. We know the communities. We know the policies. And we keep our costs down so that we can compete with the national lenders. And again, when you're working with a credit union, 
it's somebody who's an expert in the area that you're looking to buy. Okay, so there's nothing that's going to sneak up on them. And we have experience of, again, $1.7 billion in mortgages in the last three years. So we've seen pretty much everything you can see. We've been around for 30 years. So um, I could go on forever with the stories, but there's a lot that can happen. And we have a, an expert guiding you every step of the way. Um, and one thing too, that kind of is, we keep saying that the person who makes the lending decision is the person you're talking to. Usually when you go and talk to, to a lender, you're talking to the loan originator, who's the salesperson, right? He's going to promise you the world. Absolutely. It's going to be simple. We'll do all these things. I'll collect every document from you that you have. I want every tax return. I want every PACE. I want every W-2. I want every bank statement. And then they submit it to an underwriter. And the underwriter is the person who makes the lending decision. And they read through all the documentation. They come up with uh, a list of other things that you, they forgot or that they need. And they have this back and forth, which just adds bureaucracy to the process. It slows it down. We want the person that when you're asking the questions on day one, you go, okay, Joe, I want to do this. I want to do this. This is my plan. How do I get that done? They're the one who's sitting there, okay, this is how you do it, because I know that I need this document, this document, this document, and we'll get your loan approved. It cuts down on the transfer of paper. It cuts down on the confusion. And again, you ask that question day one, you're going to know the answer. It's not going to be something that comes up on you know, the day before the closing that all of a sudden now you have to you know, jump through hoops to even you know, qu qualify. We're going to know it before you even find a home. Okay. So next thing I want to just go through, just a couple of tips for standing out in a crowd, for you know, winning the bid, because not necessarily, I mean, 99% of the time, the person who bids the most is going to win the bid, right? It makes sense. They, people want money. Uh, but there are things when you're looking at comparable bids that will make you stand out in a crowd. Okay? What I found is that when everybody's bidding on properties, it almost looks like they're cheating off each other's homework. Right? You tend to bid in price bands of 10000 or 25000 or something like that, depending on the price of the home. So let's just say it's a $250,000 listing. Right? So there's going to be 10 people who bid 250000 and then there's going to be one person who thinks they're smart and bids 225. And there's going to be one person who sticks way out who bid 275. Okay. Now, in your scenario, I always tell people don't bid in the price band, bid an odd number, right? So if you're willing to pay 250, why not pay 251, 300? It's $1,300. Admittedly, $1,300 is $1,300. But the difference in monthly payment for $1,300 is about $6 a month. And if you're looking at $6 a month versus getting the house and not getting the house, it seems like a strategy that catches somebody's eye. It puts you, you know, it differentiates you from the rest of that pack, right? And now it's comparing you to the guy who bids 675 or 275, right? And so they look at those two bids and now they're going, okay, this person's way, way up high. They're way too high. There might be some risk associated with that person. Maybe they're using non-conventional financing. Maybe their credit scores aren't great. Maybe their down payment is much lower. And that's when you put yourself in a situation where you're not the highest bidder, but they might be willing to consider your application because you have other strong characteristics about yourself. Whereas if you bid 225, they've just thrown it out. And if you're one of the 10 people at 250, they're probably not going to dive into each one of them with huge depth. Okay. The second is flexible closing dates. Okay. From your perspective, if you're renting or you're living with family as a first time home buyer, you don't necessarily have uh, restraints on when you have to move. Okay. So you can make a bid when you're bidding on a property with flexible closing dates, right? Hey, I'll close any days, 30 to 90 days from today at the seller's discretion. Okay. Within a couple of days, you're going to know exactly what the timeline is. And you're going to have a, a situation where the seller feels like you're willing to work with them. Now, if there's somebody that's been in the home for 30 years, right? They raised their whole family there. They're older. They have just so much junk in there that it's going to take months to weed out, they might want to stay the full 90 days, right? Versus somebody who is, you know, already cleared out, they moved into their new home, the home's completely vacant. They go, hey, great, 30 days, let's go. I want to go. But if you bid 30 days to the person who's been there for 30 years, that might scare them off. Versus if you say, hey, 90 days to the person who wants to get out yesterday, that might scare them off. So that flexibility allows the seller to feel empowered, makes them feel like they can work with you. And again, it might be a small difference between you and the highest bidder, but if the highest bidder is rigid on their timeline, it allows you to win a bid, even though you probably uh, weren't going to pay the most money. And then the final one that I'm going to talk about very briefly is called an escalation clause. Okay, And we've seen this 
uh, a lot in the last couple of, of years. It's kind of a new phenomenon that it kind of comes and goes, but it can certainly help you. Now, say the house came up for sale for 250, right? And you're willing to pay 275. You're that person. Hey, I'll pay 275. Instead of bidding 275, what I've seen people do is, hey, I bid 250, but I'll beat the next bid by $5,000, right? Up to 275,000. Okay? So if that tight contingent of people all bid 250, you could get that same home that you would have bid 275 for, for 255, right? Which is still less than what you would have paid if you just bid it out. So it protects you because you're not kind of jumping in the deep end. It allows you to kind of see what the other people are bidding and jump ahead of them. Some real estate brokers like this, some don't. So when you're going to a situation, it's always smart to have your agent ask the listing agent if they're comfortable with that approach. And you always, for your own you know, sake, you want to have that cap. Okay, because you just say, hey, I'll beat the next bid by some amount and up to a certain price point, because there is always going to be somebody that might go way off the deep end, right? You might be a great, great buyer and you're okay with 675. Somebody comes in at or 275, somebody might come in at 400,000. Now all of a sudden you're at 405. And that's not necessarily where you wanted to be. So put that price cap, protect yourself. And my last piece of advice is to make sure that you have an amount of money that you're going to beat the next bid by that's significant. Okay. Because what you're going to get into a situation is the person, the seller has been there for 30 years, right? They're emotional about it. And you're going to put in a, a cap of a hundred dollars, let's say, right? So you're going to go and I'm going to beat the next bid by a hundred dollars. And they're looking at these two bids, but the other bid came in with this beautiful letter about the tire swing in the front yard and the, how they're two children are going to go out there and use that every day. And the seller's thinking about their children that they had on that tire. So when they go, that hundred dollars is not enough to motivate me. So they sell it to the other person over that letter. In your case, if you made it 5,000, they look at it and go, I don't really care about that kid. I'm going to take the $5,000. Okay. So that's something you want to make sure it's significant enough in the scope of the transaction that it motivates the seller to take your bid over whatever the, the, the previous bid would be. Um, so at this time, I've gone through a lot of things. I'm sure you're sick of hearing me talk. Um, questions in the chat panel, I'm happy to answer them. I'm going to put my information in there. If you want to ask a private question, you're welcome to send me emails. Uh, Octavia, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, you do have some questions actually queued up in the Q&A section. Uh, um, I can read those off. The first question is, can I close my mortgage remotely? So we can do a, a remote notary, right? Where you meet with a notary to sign the paperwork. It depends on, it, we're not going to do a, um, like a digital closing. This is not, not a legal practice to sell in the secondary market to have a, a remote closing where you're not meeting with a notary or an attorney, but we can do mail away. So say you were buying a home in, in Connecticut and you wanted to, you know, you're in Florida for the winter or something like that. We could set you up with a notary in Florida to sign the paperwork down there or wherever you were. Joe, I can tell you too that I've done so many different kind of arrangements, whether it's UPS things out with a notary. I met people at Dunkin' Donuts, restaurants, parking lots. I've gone <laughs> to people's houses. So there's a lot of things that I'm, but you're right. You still, you, you, not a digital, everyone wants digital, but that, we're not there yet. Yeah. And I would love to do digital. I'm all in on digital, but the legalities don't necessarily follow that. And the secondary market investors don't necessarily follow that. So even though some of the states have adopted it, it is not prevalent across the industry yet, but we're heading there and I, I can't wait to be there, but we're not there just yet. Thank you. Thank you Dave, for chiming in too. That was funny. Um, I can take the question from Lori. Um, thank you for this question, Lori. So you're going to see a lot of print advertising right now about you know, these news stories saying you know, the Biden administration is coming out with this fee that's going to tax the higher uh, credit borrowers to subsidize the affordability programs. Uh, this is spun in a way that it is a, it's significant. There are changes to, to the way that rates and terms are going to be offered effective on 5-1. But the way they make it seem is that because you have good credit, we're going to charge you a fee. The credit union is not going to charge you that fee, right? The way that it works is that there are risk assessments on every loan that gets originated and sold to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. One of these uh, 
quasi-government agencies that are regulated by the FHFA. And what they do is they look at different risk characteristics and they basically charge me fees depending on how risky the loans are. So things like investment properties, uh, non-owner occupied second homes, uh, multifamily properties, lower credit tiers, uh, condos with certain down payments, things that have traditionally been riskier categories, they charge me fees, which impacts the rates and terms that I can offer to you, right? Now that is always been the case since the collapse. So that in 2006, they had this model and it just gets a little bit more complex and more complex. Now, what they did is they changed some of the fees on the higher tiers very marginally, it's very small, and they lowered some of the, the fees on the lower credit tiers and the lower down payment tiers. So again, it's all about property type, occupancy type, down payment percentage, credit score, all of these things. They make it seem like it's just no matter what happens, this person gets charged a fee. It's not like that. It just impacts the rates and terms that I can offer. In some situations, it has no bearing. In some situations, it's very significant. Um, the cost for good credit borrowers to borrow are still going to be significantly lower than lower credit tiers. And I think the motivation of the change was to help people that have had um, lower income brackets, right? So if you have affordability issues, we're trying to help with affordability. So by having these larger fees for lower down payments, they're actually effectively blocking out a huge segment of the population from being able to afford purchasing a home. Um, this is not gonna change it. Right? This is not going to be something that's going to really open up uh, a ton of opportunity for lower down payment and lower credit borrowers, but they did, did shift that expense up slightly. Again, it's not significant. I can send anybody who wants to see the loan level pricing adjustments grid so that they can see it. It's very complex mortgage banking, but again, it's not, a, um, it's not going to be significant. And basically, these risk assessment fees get paid to the federal government. And uh, they're figuring out a way that they can continue to take this reserve in the event that loans become you know, delinquent again. They have a reserve to, to kind of uh, contribute to keep liquidity providers available so that the housing market doesn't get impacted by it. Don't be fearful that if you come to Members Mortgage or any lender right now that because you have you know, 800 credit and 20% down that your rate's going to be higher than somebody who has 3% you know, down with 620 credit. You're still going to have the best rates in terms available. So an anonymous attendee asked about first-time homebuyer programs. So we do have first-time homebuyer programs. Uh, there's actually a free class online through Home Ready through Fannie Mae. It's totally free. Um, if anybody's interested here, actually, I might be able to pull it up. Andrew, are you about to post the link? Yes, I'm going to put it right into... Okay, make sure you put it to everyone. Uh, okay, hold on a second. I'm going to put it right in the chat. I'll put it with the... Uh... Okay. And so that is a link to single family housing through Fannie Mae. Um, and it's the home view class, totally free. You can go online and it's all about first time home buyers. It's all about uh, different programs in place. And essentially the fees that we were just talking about, the loan level pricing adjustments, which is again, complex. Uh, if you go through this class, you're a first time home buyer and your income is at 100% of the average median income for the area or lower, those fees go away. So you actually may end up with um, lower rates in, in terms for taking this class. Uh, and again, if you have a 3% down mortgage, you'd have to take this class. So it's certainly worthwhile to go through it, get a nice little certificate at the end saying that you completed it. And it's a um, it's an excellent kind of overview of lendings for first time home buyers so you can be prepared. All right. And then somebody asked if we cover Fairfield County. Absolutely. Yeah, no, no, no problem at all. Um, we don't do New York, but Fairfield County is well within our range. Uh, we cover, again, all of New England, Florida, and oddly enough, California. Uh, we have a, a huge contingent out in California that we, we work with because we have some credit unions out there. So if you work anywhere in the state of Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, we have you covered. And I know time is um, ticking, but I do have one other question uh, for the members that are hesitant and they do reach out to one of your agents and going through the process, they feel that just right now is not the best time. There's things that they need to improve, uh, things they need to save for. How long are, will members mortgage work with that member to see them through 
uh, the process. Oh, as long as they need. Um, so we have people, I've worked with people for five, six years before they bought a house, right? The reality is that you very seldom do you, you know, fill out an application and you're ready to buy that moment. Uh, we have all sorts of credit modeling tools and you know, what if calculators. So if you pay this off, what does it do my credit score? And we're willing to work with you. We're not credit advisory people. It's not my, my business. Um, so if you have like bankruptcy questions and things like that, we're probably not the best people to talk to about it. But in terms of, you know, hey, I had a delinquent student loan. I had, you know, missed car payments. Or can I just you know, go over my credit profile with you? What can I do to improve my score? How, you know, what are things that are, are weighing on my credit? We can certainly look through your credit report with you, explain all of the different things available um, in terms of, of our modeling tools and, and give you copies of those reports so that you're, again, a more informed consumer. I mean, that's really what we want is for you to be informed, be prepared, and so that you are successful. Because, you know, if you go through this and you, you finally call somebody when you have a contract, you might end up in a situation where your rates and terms are going to be significantly higher, where it's almost prohibitive when you could have called us a couple of months beforehand. Um, and kind of got yourself situated, got you know, a delinquent medical bill that you didn't even know about, right? We figure that out. We get it all situated, all taken care of before you go into this so we can improve your credit so you can get the best rates and terms available. Thanks, Joe. Okay, we're going to wrap it up, but I just want to leave it with three things. Uh, the first thing is don't hesitate to reach out to members mortgage. You might not feel that you're totally ready, but have a conversation and see what they can do for you and help you ease the nerves and get you into a better place. Um, so you can get the home of your dreams. Um, another thing is, you know, everyone's scared about the rate, but this is kind of going around. I just want to say it, marry the home, date the rate. Um, if you find the home of your dreams, go for it. Um, you know, there's options to refinance. You have arms out there as well that your rate can adjust possibly to a better rate in the future. So don't let that hold you back. And the last thing is we do have closing cost credit specials that you could qualify for. So when you reach out to a member's mortgage, always ask to see what we have available um, that can probably help you with the out-of-pocket cost. So um, that's it. I want to thank everyone for their time. I want to thank David, Joe, Cora, thank you for coming on today and for all of our members and potential members for spending your evening with us. Thank you. And we'll see you next year when we do this again, right? <laughs> Looking forward to it. Can't all wait. Right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. Bye -bye. Thank you, have guys. Night. Have a good night.